reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, amen. You guys can take a seat. How's it going this morning? You guys are like slightly more awake than the 915 crowd. How's it going this morning? So uh, if we haven't met, my name's Andy. I'm the lead pastor here. It's great to be together this morning. And as we kick off a new series today, I want to open with uh, these words from Jacob Saguero. He says, following Jesus is not a hobby. Jesus is not a when you get a chance thing. Jesus is not a casual thing for enjoyment. Following Jesus is not a weekend thing. He says, Jesus is a king that you give your life to. Jesus is a friend you give your time to. Jesus is a savior you give your gratitude to. There was actually a golf dig in there. It said some people love golf more than Jesus, but I thought that might be a little too hard hitting for the slide. <laughs> Jesus is not a casual thing. I wonder, maybe you're curious, maybe you're skeptical about faith this morning, maybe you're exploring Jesus, and already when you see those words, you're like, did I come to the right place? Maybe this isn't for me after all. If that is you, you're welcome, stick with it, we're glad you're here, but the point here is that a casual or part-time level of commitment to Jesus most often ends up leaving us in a place of dissatisfaction. It ends up leaving us wondering because it actually doesn't reach down into the depths of our lives. It doesn't permeate all the way into our desires and our motivations, which are the things which when we allow Jesus into them and allow Jesus to transform them, lead us to lasting satisfaction. They lead us to freedom from fear and anxiety. They lead us to joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. They lead us to peace, even when life is chaotic and so much more. You see, the offer of Jesus when he says, come and follow me, is an offer to engage in a completely different and better kind of life. A completely different and better kind of life both today and in eternity. We know it, we trust it very often for eternity, but sometimes we fail to realize that the degree to which we experience it here and now is actually connected to our own willingness to open ourselves up to Jesus, his wisdom, and his teaching. A few months ago, I was uh, sitting down with Francisco, and I was talking with him about a situation where I was uh, frustrated uh, that God had not yet answered a prayer of mine on the timeline that I thought was reasonable. It was one of those where I was like, this should be an easy thing. Lord, I know you can do it, so like, let's hurry up, please. And uh, wisely, uh, Francisco said to me, he said, well, have you actually prayed about it? And he said, I mean, actually prayed about it. Have you actually brought it to the Lord? Or have you just kind of like thought about it some? And at the time, I, of course, gave the right Christian pastor answer. It was like, yes, of course, I've prayed about it, obviously. But then as I reflected later, I realized, you know what? At one time, yes, that was true. At one time, I really was giving this thing to God. But lately, 
What I've actually been doing is just circling and rehearsing my frustration and then tagging God on to the end of it. And I say that simply to illustrate that it is so easy to sort of consider yourself or regard yourself as all in for Jesus or very committed to your faith, whilst in actual reality living in a completely different way. Whilst in actual reality, if you were to look at your calendar or your bank statement or the desires that drive you or where you put your energy or what you aspire to, if we were to look at those things, you might say, well, my life actually looks completely identical to everyone else who lives in this county. It's so easy to say we're committed to Jesus, but actually not be open to what he has to say to us. The good news is he has more for us. And so that reason, I'm excited about this teaching series that's going to take us the whole fall all the way through Thanksgiving on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to walk through it more or less step by step over the next few months. It's a book of, uh, it's a sermon with the most comprehensive and famous teachings of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. If you're new to this part of scripture, Matthew is one of the four gospels, the accounts of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus in the first century. And this is his summary of Jesus' teaching, and it shows up in a couple of other places too. So the Sermon on the Mount, what is it? Dallas Willard says this, he says, the Sermon on the Mount is a concise statement of Jesus' teaching on how to actually live in the reality of God's present kingdom available to us from the very space surrounding our bodies. Do you know that this morning? The kingdom of God is available to you right where you are, right where you're sitting. Look down at the space around you. The kingdom of God, his presence is there whether you realize it or not. And so what we want to do in this series is look through and talk through what does it look like to live into that. And so as we do that, there are some resources that can help you because this is such a rich teaching. There's so much to get out of it, to mine out of it. Jesus has so much for us. We can't even cover it all on these Sundays. And so uh, there's a book over on the Resource Center, The Narrow Path by Rich Lotus that just came out. You can pick that up. And then a variety of other resources at that link on the website as well. But the Sermon on the Mount is this description of life with Jesus, this invitation to life in his kingdom. And what Jesus does in the sermon is push up against some of the assumptions that we, as well as his first listeners, have about life. He challenges the norms of life in first century Israel and life in 21st century New York. And as a result, what you find in the Sermon on the Mount is something that's simultaneously incredibly comforting, but also incredibly challenging. We see Jesus in this sermon speaking right to the people in front of him, to their challenges, to their problems, to their difficulties, to their strife. And I believe if if you need comfort from Jesus today, he wants to pour it out on you abundantly. He wants to do that for you this fall. And at the same time, he also challenges deeply things that maybe we've held on to that aren't actually part of his way. If you're not personally challenged at some point in reading these words from Jesus, it perhaps means we haven't fully read it or fully understood it. Some have said that the Sermon on the Mount comforts the afflicted, but also afflicts the comfortable. So hopefully you're ready for that. Because honestly, not everyone likes the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone has a positive view of it. Many have dismissed it as uh, idealistic or, or too visionary. George Bernard Shaw called it an impractical outburst of anarchism and sentimentality. So if you're looking for anarchy, you're in the right place. As we read this sermon over these next weeks, so some of those same things might come up for you. There are times when it perhaps feels like the demands of the sermon, the instructions of the sermon, the standards of the sermon are, are just too high and too lofty to possibly ever attain, which in some ways is actually the point. Because Jesus, yes, is giving us wisdom for life, but he's also trying to do something else. He's also trying deliberately to push us towards his grace and mercy and forgiveness. 
He's trying to show us that we, in fact, cannot do it ourselves. We cannot dig ourselves out of the hole. We cannot save ourselves. Only he can do that for us. And so at its core, the sermon is this invitation to life now and life forever in the kingdom of God. So over these next weeks, we're uh, going to talk about a variety of things. We're going to talk about what Jesus says about the law. How do we understand that? We're going to think about how to deal with our anger and our judgments. We're going to think about a Christian vision of marriage and sexuality and how to think about divorce. We're going to talk about what it looks like to love our enemies. How does retaliation and violence come into that? We're going to think about what it looks like to avoid being possessed by our possessions and our money. Today, though, we start at the beginning. Verse 3 of Matthew 5, Jesus begins this famous teaching with the Beatitudes, some of the most famous words ever actually spoken. This is the preface, if you like, to the Sermon on the Mount, these blessings that he offers. On the surface, maybe these blessings feel like sort of aspirational character traits that we might seek to adopt. I was actually talking with someone this week, we read these together, and and he said, you know, I find these unrelatable. They don't seem to be true in my life. They're kind of these soft traits that aren't part of my hard personality. It's almost as if Jesus, you might think, in line with a recent TikTok trend, is saying things like, blessed are the demure, blessed are the cutesy, blessed are the mindful. Anyone seen that? Those who are laughing know what I'm talking about. We might hear the Beatitudes, or we might think, well, I'm not really like those. I don't really resonate with those words. Can we just like move on to the meat of the Sermon on the Mount? But Jesus doesn't want us to miss this. He has something deep and important for us, specifically at least these two things. The first of all, blessed or blessed doesn't mean what you think it does, probably. And secondly, that those who are blessed, the blessed people, aren't who you think they are, probably. See, each of the Beatitudes follows this same formula, blessed or blessed are the blank for they will something. Now, sometimes that word blessed uh, is used in a very churchy way. Maybe someone even coming in this morning said, have a blessed day. Hopefully not. We try not to be that kind of religious-y kind of church. But maybe that's how you hear that word. Uh, Maybe you use that word primarily when someone sneezes and you say, did you know that when you do that, you're actually channeling some very medieval spiritual energy when you say bless you? Did you know that? No? Uh, Back in the medieval era, when someone would sneeze, the thought was their soul was leaving their body. And that was a bad thing. And so you would say bless you to hopefully get that soul back inside. (laughs) So please don't be offended if I don't say bless you when you sneeze. Back in the 2010s, anyone remember hashtag blessed? A great excuse to show off your near perfect life to the world online. Or maybe you uh, think of uh, asking for someone's blessing, right, in a marriage proposal. Gentlemen, maybe you asked uh, a father or a family member for the blessing before you propose to your spouse. But none of those meanings, thankfully, really capture what Jesus is talking about. The Greek word throughout this passage is was makarios. Uh, Some translations say blessed, others say happy, which is closer, but it's still not strong enough. When Jesus says blessed are so-and-so, he's he's saying the highest type of well-being that's possible for a human. When someone is blessed, it's ultimate bliss, total joy, total satisfaction. That's what he's trying to convey. One thinker says that the best English translation of this word is really, congratulations, your life is amazing. Congratulations, your life is amazing. That's what the word blessed in Matthew chapter 5 means. That's what we should be thinking about, not someone who just sneezed. See, to be blessed in the biblical mindset is to be elevated at the top of your game, almost like a sports team returning after a major victory. These guys are blessed. Congratulations. You're at the top of your game. Your life is amazing. We're all celebrating and cheering for you. You are blessed. That's what to think about when you hear the word blessed in the Beatitudes, which makes 
What Jesus has to say next, after that word, all the more astounding. Why? Because the blessed people aren't who we usually think they are. He says, blessed are who? The poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, meaning they don't have righteousness in their life right now, the merciful, the pure in heart, the the peacemakers, meaning there's conflict where peacemaking is needed, the persecuted, the insulted. What you might ask is Jesus thinking when he says this, these are not people to whom you would say, congratulations, your life is amazing. You've been insulted, you're in conflict, you're mourning, congratulations, your life is amazing. Is Jesus gaslighting you? He's not. But it's a common misunderstanding that, that these things in the Beatitudes are intended as sort of virtues to live up to that these are Jesus' spiritual checklists for your life. Do them and you will receive the approval of God, right? Mourn a little bit more, be more weak, set up yourself to be insulted, and then, then you will receive God's blessing. And in order to do that, theologians make up all kinds of inventions about what these words mean to get it all to make sense. They say, well, if someone's mourning, they can't really be mourning because you're not blessed if you're mourning, so you must be mourning over your sin, and then it kind of works. Or if you're meek, well, you're probably not blessed if you're meek because that's really weak and it puts you in a difficult position, and so meekness really means strength under control. They invent new meanings to all these words to make it make sense, but that's not what Jesus is doing. Willard says this, The Beatitudes simply cannot be good news if they are understood as a set of how-tos for achieving blessedness. Then they would only amount to a new legalism. They would not serve to throw open the kingdom anything but. Don't interpret these words from Jesus as him saying that you should aspire to be destitute, that you should aim to be poor or under attack in some kind of weird and twisted way. That's not the way to earn the approval of God. There isn't a way to earn the approval of God. He's saying something far more profound and he doesn't want us to miss it. You see, the Beatitudes push against the assumptions of their day and ours in a very deep way. Lists like this weren't unusual in the writings of that time. Look at this uh, list from about a century before Jesus from the writings of Sirach. And he has a list of blessed people. Here it is, I can think of nine whom I would call blessed and a tenth my tongue proclaims. First, a man who can rejoice in his children. So if you're male, you're blessed. If you have kids, you're blessed. Second, a man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. Well, who doesn't want that? (laughs) Right, your enemies die or in our context, you make every deal at work, you beat out the competition. Happy is the man who lives with a sensible wife, okay. Next, the one who does not plow with an ox and ass together, because that's just really hard, don't we all know? What he means is you're not plowing with unequally heighted animals, and so it all kind of works, right? Your business is great, you're working efficiently, you have the right tools, you're smart. Happy is the one who does not sin with the tongue. You're well-spoken, great at cocktail parties. You haven't served an inferior. You've never had to work for someone who wasn't as good as their job as you are. You're at the top of the food chain. You live in a democracy. You get to make choices. Happy is one who finds a friend. You're cool. People want to be friends with you. You speak to attentive listeners. People are eager to hear what you have to say. You're an interesting person. How great is the one who finds wisdom. You're someone who people go to for advice. And then lastly, none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful life? Now, nothing is wrong with this list. I'm not down on this list. The problem is when we mistake this list for the entire story. I want to be clear. If your life looks a lot or a little like this, congratulations. Your life is amazing. And I'd encourage you to recognize that even if a little part of this is true for you, that's often unusual, especially on a global scale. 
Jesus is saying the problem is not that this list exists, but that we so often buy into it as saying these are the only people who are blessed, only the successful, only the upwardly mobile, only the people who have made it in the eyes of the world are the blessed ones. If you've achieved the good life, God is on your side. Because when we put this list side by side with the Beatitudes, which one is the list that we spend functionally most of our time and energy trying to achieve? See, very often we actually spend our lives trying to avoid the things on the Beatitudes list, at least most of them, because they're uncomfortable. They put us in a lower position. Like who has on their full bucket list, I really want to be poor in spirit, persecuted and insulted in the next few months? No one. If I look back at some of the most difficult times in my life, the most unpleasant times, they've actually been the times when the Beatitudes have been true of me. Time when evil has been spoken about me. Times when I'm waiting for righteousness to come. Time when there's conflict and I want peace. And in those moments, I have to be honest and confess, I wasn't thinking, wow, God calls me blessed. No, I was thinking, God, you need to hurry up and fix this, please. The Beatitudes are usually not a fun list to actually be on. And so instead, we try to be on the other list. Again, not that that's totally bad. It's certainly good and right to fear God and want wisdom. And it's fine to receive the blessings of God as they come to us, even in material and worldly ways. Those are blessings from God. I am absolutely not down on them. But our human temptation is to make them everything. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus comes against that kind of thinking. The Beatitudes are an invitation and a challenge to change the value system of our hearts about who's blessed and who is not, including, and maybe especially, am I blessed or am I not? The Beatitudes aren't a character trait to try and live up to. The Beatitudes aren't a checklist to be acceptable to God. Here's what they are. They are pronouncements of grace. They are declarations that the grace of God is coming toward you no matter where you find yourself in life. We imagine perhaps Jesus looking at a very real crowd with their very real problems, sitting in front of him and looking at them with mercy in his eyes and he says, I see that you are mourning. I see the loss of that father, that mother, that child. Even you can experience new life in the kingdom. I see that you are weak, that you can't provide for yourself, your finances are a mess. Even you can be blessed in the eyes of God. I see you're in conflict and you're trying to make peace. I see that you're mocked by family members for following me. Even you can receive security and affirmation in me. I hold on to those words from Jesus for me, but also for us, because aren't those things, aren't these beatitudes the way that life most often really truly looks? Even just this week, I've walked with many of us whose lives look and feel not especially blessed. The passing of loved ones unexpectedly or expectedly. Estrangement from family members and children. Conflict at work with colleagues that won't go away. Trauma that resurfaces. Dissatisfaction with where we find ourselves in life. There's so many things going on in the reality of the world. And if that's you, what Jesus is doing here is turning the tables on how to think about yourself. God wants to enfold you in his kingdom. He wants to say, you are blessed by me, not just in spite of your circumstances, but in fact, even through them. He says, even if you find yourself spiritually bankrupt, you're poor in spirit, you are blessed by God. Even if you're overwhelmed by the sadness of the world, even if you don't stand up for yourself or assert your rights, even if you're broken by injustice, 
Even if your heart is so soft that you get hurt a lot, even if you're concerned with how you appear, even if you're always trying to pacify others, even if you're always in conflict, even if your convictions get you in trouble, even if all of those things, God looks at you and calls you blessed. Why? Because of Jesus. He says, no human condition, no matter how difficult it may appear, no matter how despised you are by the world, no matter how insignificant or unsuccessful people call you, none of that disqualifies you from God's grace in Christ for all who would say yes to him. In the Beatitudes, he's heaping grace on all the people that the world said don't deserve it. He's heaping blessing on all the people who thought there's no way I could be blessed. The world and its evaluation of who wins and who loses does not have the final say, says Matthew 5. The final say is in Jesus and it's at the cross. Because what does he do on the cross? On the cross, Jesus becomes every single one of those beatitudes. He becomes poor in spirit. He's mourning, he's insulted, he's persecuted, and yet still merciful and a peacemaker in doing so. He becomes all of these things, but what doesn't he get? Blessing. He takes it all on, he doesn't get the blessing. In fact, scripture says what he gets instead is the curse. Why? So we can get the blessing. That's good news, but it's very disruptive to our expectations. Jesus ends the Beatitudes by saying, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, and then he says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Now again, if you're like me, your response might be, no thanks Jesus. That's a nice idea, but I'd honestly rather get my reward now, if that's okay. Delayed gratification just isn't my thing. To which, I imagine perhaps if we were to say that, Jesus would respond with such love, but also such challenge and say, you have no idea what you'd be missing out on if that's what I gave to you. Because his invitation is actually an invitation to repentance which isn't a negative or, or bad word, it just means to have a redirection of the way that you're living and thinking. Jesus is inviting us to stop running after the things of the world and instead give all that we have to run after him. Why? Because that's where actual life is. That's where actual freedom is. That's where actual abundance is. He says, when you run after me, when you say yes to me, all of these blessings are yours no matter what you're going through in life. Back to the beginning, if Jesus is your hobby, you're probably gonna get hobby level satisfaction out of following him. At best, he'll be kind of a distraction. Or a little more, if Jesus is only your insurance policy, if he's only your fallback plan, if your plan doesn't work, your experience of his grace is probably gonna be occasional and infrequent, only having to turn to him when you get to the edge of the cliff. But, says Jesus, if Jesus is your king, that's when you experience the blessings of the Beatitudes. If Jesus is your king, suddenly you are free to live in all of the wisdom and direction that's gonna follow in the Sermon on the Mount without fear and without anxiety. If Jesus is your king, suddenly difficult choices in life and easy choices in life are opportunities to trust him. When Jesus is your king, you can lift your gaze and live with an eternal perspective, why? Because he's in control. Because your day-to-day -day experiences of being completely and totally enveloped in his presence and his kingdom, and that is the place where peace and joy and true security come from. We get the blessings of the Beatitudes when Jesus is our all. We get the blessings of the Beatitudes not because of our circumstances, 
not even just despite them, but through them, but it all depends on Jesus. Amen? Let's stand. I want to pray for some people, and uh, you can put that up. I want you to just think for a few moments whether any one of these uh, three next steps that I have on the screen might be you, and if they are, we want to pray for you. The first is, uh, for some people, I believe God wants to give them a new heart towards others. That as we've spoken today, you've realized, you know what, I've really held a uh, human, worldly standard of who's blessed, who's doing well, who's not. And that there are maybe lowly, humanly people in my life who I've looked down on, and I want God to change my heart towards those people. That's number one. The second is for some of you, you're realizing that even if maybe Jesus was king before, or maybe he's never been, there's something in your life, your circumstances, just time has kind of made it into a hobby or a helper. And for some of you, Jesus is inviting you to say, make me king again. Give me everything again. And then for some of you, you've never in your life yet uh, said definitively yes to Jesus. Said, Jesus, I am committed to following you. You are my savior. You are my Lord. And so I just want you to uh, just be still for a moment. If you're comfortable, close your eyes. I'm going to invite the Spirit and just ask the Lord, are any of these things something that you want me to respond to today? So Spirit of God, would you come? We know and we trust that you're here and we ask us to illuminate in our hearts how you want us to respond today. Let's take a few moments of quiet while you ponder those things. things is something that you're feeling led to respond to today, I just want to ask you to do a bold thing, which is just raise your hand where you are, because uh, there's power in just identifying that that's true for you. So just go ahead and raise your hand where you are if you want to respond to any of those things, and uh, we'd like to pray for you. If you're close to someone with a hand raised, would you just uh, keep your hand up if it's up, uh, all the way up, and if you're around someone with a raised hand, would you please just lay a hand on them? I uh, want to make sure everyone who's responding has someone praying for them. So uh, just make sure, open your eyes up. Let's get hands on everyone who's responding. And so I want to pray for each of you. So for the first two groups, I'm going to pray for you. And then for the third, I've got a response for all of us. So Father, we pray right now, Spirit of God, come. Spirit of God, come. We thank you that the promise of Scripture is that where our hearts are hard, you turn them from hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And so I ask that you would do that right now. For any who need a new posture or a new attitude uh, towards others in their life, we pray, would you impart that right now in the name of Jesus? Would you soften hard edges? Would you uh, give new eyes to see the image of God in every person? Without guilt, without shame, Lord, would you do heart surgery to enable us to be your love in every moment of every day. For those who want to return to you as their king, who want to give every part of themselves to you, we just say yes to that in the name of Jesus. We bless that right now. We bless you if that's you with deep conviction, not of your own will, but of the Spirit of God, because he's the one who's actually going to do that in you. And so we pray, Spirit of God, come. Return hearts that have wandered from you all the way back into your throne room. Cause hearts that have gone their own way to turn back and bow before your throne today. To say, Jesus, you are everything. Jesus, you have every part of me. Jesus, I'll follow you even into difficult places. Lord, would you just cause trust to grow in every one of those hearts right now? We trust that by your supernatural power, you can do it. Come, Spirit of God. 
And then finally, if you wanna say yes to Jesus today, if you wanna say, Jesus, this is the day where I'm committing to follow you, uh, there's a prayer we're gonna put on the screen and I wanna invite you to pray this with me. Uh, if you're on the prayer team, would you also just pray this with us so that we have people joining with those who are committing today? And so we pray, pray with me if this is for you. Jesus, I choose today to say yes to following you. I give you my whole life and I place my full faith and trust in you now and always. Thank you that you died and rose for me so that I could be forgiven and set free from the power of sin. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please help me to live as your apprentice each day. I welcome you to come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.